love podcasts, hate nonsense. It's the Politics Joe podcast, ladies and gentlemen. It's a long round of applause. Ed Campbell, the bastard prince, remains in Cornwall. Where Ed he shall stay, right? Yeah, well, you don't come back from that. No. Ava Santina about to join Ed Campbell in Cornwall. Well, lucky me. Sean's already halfway there. Do you think it, it threatens me that you might end my life? <laughs> because it doesn't. You should feel threatened by that. <laughs> if that was if that's what you thought, that would that that is a rational thing to be mm. scared of. Mm. Death. Mm. Why isn't it? No, no. Sorry, I was... What is dead may never die. As a Catholic, I don't fear death. I know where I'm going. <laughs> Downstairs. <laughs> yeah. Happy liaison committee day. Thank you. Happy liaison committee day to you too. To all who celebrate. Mm. How do we feel about Rishi Sunak's select committee appearances? Um, so someone I once was chatting to who had to appear before a select committee said his plan was to be as boring as he could be. Yeah. To 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 speak quite slowly. Good strategy. Um, just just say get, not not necessarily not say anything that's important, but just just be quite dull. Mm. And I think that Sunak might have received the same advice. Well, if you're not a prime minister, you definitely don't want to be the guy that goes viral. No one's ever heard of you. No one cares what you know, you're testifying about fucking farming, or whatever it is. Wow, we're just going to slap down on the farmers now, yeah? Yeah, fuck the farmers. and then Take you, that back. You don't mean that, and you know that. The audience know I don't mean that. Well, there might be a rogue. This is very meta. They understand what I'm saying. I'm having like, there's two, there's two dialogues happening right now. Right. One with you, one with the people listening. Okay. And what I say to them actually means something different. Right. Because I am like type A galaxy brain. Yeah? Okay. Yes. It's great for you. <laughs> yeah. What was I going to say? Yeah, so if you're some fucking idiot farmer. <laughs> you don't want to be going viral because you said something a bit silly. Mm. Or oh, got a bit out of hand. You just want to give the evidence, get out. And whilst it, it that rationale also stands for the prime minister, mm. people are paying more attention to those select committees. But I think he's just a, he's a technocrat. He likes this kind of setting. He likes let's do detail. And by way of contrast, that is a, a departure from... Did Liz Truss do a liaison committee? I don't think she had time. She, well, you know, give her a minute, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Could to get bedded in. Yeah. Could to get comfy. She, she just took the... Uh, What's it called? The, the check that you get when you leave. Severance pay. She just took the severance package. Mm. So the last one before him was Boris Johnson. And you could, you could see the contempt they all had for each other. Yeah. Caroline Noakes. She hated him. Yeah. You felt it. But that's because Caroline is just a completely different personality to him. You felt it. You did feel it. Palpable. It was visceral. Yeah. Whereas now it's like everyone wants to shine Rishi Sunak's shoes. Well, William Ragg felt a little bit like that when he was having his little joke with him about the deep state. Um, but I think that that's because he's standing down at the mm. next election and declared that he was over a year and a half ago. Mm. And I think he just doesn't care anymore. That's good, isn't it? That's good for democracy. Well, I think that's what you want out of your public servants. <laughs> Apathy. Apathy. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Rag is just upset he can't do it from home. Aren't we all? Mm. So I guess we'll go through some clips from the select committee. Yeah, all right. Can you try and sound a bit more upbeat about it? You're all upset. You were excited about this upstairs. This morning we came in, the sun was shining. Ollie, Ollie skipped in. And he was like... You don't know that. I was here before you. Yeah, well, I get feedback, don't I? And, in what medium? Uh, well, Laura's always let me know what's what. And, uh, you know, so you, so you swanned in 
and straight away you're on Slack. Oh, should, we, should we do a bonus podcast today? And I said, yes, I'd love to. And you said, I'd love to. Now, here you are. And now it's raining. Yeah. And as someone who studied English literature, you would know what pathetic fallacy is. Right. Um, some good news. If it's raining, did you know if it's raining in Manchester? I think it might just be on a Monday. You get a free pint at any Green King pub, but across the country. How much are they paying you? What, Green King? What are you doing, are you doing that for? What are you promoting for Green King? It's a free pint. How am I promoting? Go and have your pint at Green King. And that then sounds, go a lot, sounds a lot like an advertisement And to then me. go somewhere else. Then go somewhere else. Yes. Right. Do you want to roll the clip? Maybe. <laughs> Do we have anything else we need to discuss before we roll the clip? Well, what, would you, what would you like to, to get off your chest? Appa- apparently I need to fucking butt my ideas up. I never said that. This is very definitely what you were implying. Look. Are you projecting? All the time. (laughs) And no one's listening? (laughs) Never. No one ever asks me how I'm doing. That's not true. When was the last time you asked me? Ollie, how are you? Exactly. You're doing that. You're compensating. Would you like to talk about the fragility of men? (laughs) Ava, that's so considerate. Thank you for asking. (laughs) Another time. Okay. There's a few things we need to watch. Do watch alongs for. Yeah. Because I think if we're going to do Robbie Williams at Nebworth, mm. and if we're going to do June 2... Then we should do something manly. Then we should do Turkish oil wrestling. Y- yes. That's my pick. Is it? Well, did no. you watch it after the record? No, I d- I'm just saying I'd be pro that. Sean watched it after the record. Well, of course he did, you know. He was shocked. His phrase was, I can't believe they're elbow deep. <laughs> my gosh. Are they really? <laughs> oh, Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can't, I cannot describe to you. <laughs> it, what, the way I described it yesterday, mm. that is what it is. Right. Well, fair enough. See, it's so much better when we talk about things like that. It is, it is better. You want to talk about fucking local authorities for? I love talking about local authorities. This is the problem. Yeah. What if you went and watched June? Mm. David Lynch version. No, but I told you I'd go and watch June. Yeah. But you said no yesterday. Yeah. I said, I'll go this morning. Not on work time. But why would I go in my own time when it's not something I would enjoy? I've got such little free time as it is. Oh. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But you could send me. Why, why didn't I go tomorrow morning? No. Well, settled. Should we roll the clip? Why don't you go this evening? Because I'm out this evening. At the cinema? I'm <laughs> Watching June 2. It would be quite torturous for me to go and watch June 2. Why? I can't think of anything worse. I can. What would be worse than... A lot of things. Okay. What would be your version of going to watch June? It's got to be something I like doing that you don't like doing. Sitting here, spending an hour talking to you about local authority budgets. But you know, that's really upsetting. That's, I, I, that's why it took me so long to say it, because it's the first thing I thought of, and I thought, you can't say that. It's horrible, that, isn't it? Yeah, I knew it would hurt you. It did hurt me. I do enjoy. Sorry. I do enjoy. This? Yeah. I do too. But it's good to... Oh. <laughs> this is far more emotional than I was expecting it to be. I know. <laughs> Roll the clip? Yeah, roll the clip. In the last eight years, uh, uh, sorry, six years, eight councils have effectively declared bankruptcy. In the previous 16 years, none had. So what is the fundamental problem? And before we say all those councils have made mistakes, some of them have, but as John Fuller, the uh, Conservative leader, of, um, said to the uh, Select Committee recently, uh, while the, the problems uh, have been specific to some councils, there's now a more general problem. And in the next year or two, about half the authorities will be in financial distress, potentially. Isn't that a fundamental crisis in local government finance? Well, I think that the first thing to say is councils are the backbone of their communities and they carry out tremendous work every day, delivering important services to the people they serve. And, yeah, I, I got to experience that as local government minister 
also being scrutinized by you, Clive, at, at the time. And uh, as we discussed then, recognized that they face challenges. Uh, but that's why, particularly over this parliament, significantly more funding has gone into local government, and most recently, £600 million boost in the local, uh, the recent, most recent local government finance settlement, which has meant that councils, on average, will have around 7.5% more spending power this forthcoming year than they did last year. Um, and that settlement, I think, was, was warmly welcomed by local government association, county councils network, and indeed the but district council that's network. That's in the context, isn't it, of a 30% cut in spending power in the last 14 years. And again, as uh, Councillor Fuller, a, a Conservative leader, said to us, uh, quoting the figures uh, that he's experiencing, when you've got adult social care spending going up by 90%, Children with complex needs are going up by 23%, and your uh, spending power is going up by 3 to 5%. It does not take a mass genius to work out that there's going to be a gap at some stage, and that gap, according to the LGA, now is around £4 billion, even after the extra money in the budget. The IFS says it's about £7 billion. That's a crisis, isn't it? Is it really sustainable that local councils could face no increase in support from government at all for four years, and not make increased cuts to their services, which already are at rock bottom, or put council tax up by excessive amounts. What is going to give, Prime Minister? Well, I, I don't think we're going to write the next spending review here and now. But, um, but it's, so in, it's as, in the forecast. Uh, again, the next spending review hasn't been done, so people, are, people can forecast all they want until the spending review is actually done. But there I thought you had a plan, Prime Minister. To, to comment on what I can tell you, and actually as the chair opened with, overall public spending is forecast to grow. Clive Betts got quite animated, didn't he? I mean, that was the height of the emotion, I would say, throughout the whole select committee. Well, local authority funding can be emotional. <laughs> it can arouse the passions. Yeah, it can. <laughs> yes. Um, well, yeah, no, so, so Clive Betts is asking the question that I think, you know, do you know when we say, like, let's get out of Westminster? The Conservatives always want to get out of Westminster. But then when they get out of Westminster, they get go right back to Westminster. Yeah, they're like, this is fucking minging. <laughs> this is awful. <laughs> um, and, you know, he's asking the question that everyone's wondering right now, which is why on earth are all the councils bankrupt? You know, why, why, what? <laughs> That's a fair question. It's just an insane thing to say. <laughs> why are all the councils bankrupt, Rishi? <laughs> but why are they? Someone should do something about this. <laughs> you know, Sunak is so big on, he, he gets it cosmetically right because of the potholes right that was just like that the potholes he, he gave billions to councils to fix potholes because he knows that when people go to the booth to the polling station later this year they're going to have run over a pothole and think fuck him i'm not voting for him it's not central government's responsibility to pave those over but he gave the billions and for what a vanity project. Mm. What about adult social care, Rishi? What about the housing issues, Rishi? Mm. What about schools, Rishi? What about Nottinghamshire Coun Council setting up their own energy company, Rishi? <laughs> yeah, well, look. <laughs> that was... All right. <laughs> what, what about what about Birmingham Council's equal pay dispute? Okay, so... For three so quarters so of a billion is, pounds. This is, this is Ollie Dugmore coming out of the woodwork to oppose equal pay. <laughs> 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 the reason the reason I have a problem with that decision is because it it would involve paying women the same as men. Yeah, that, that's that's the problem I have with that. Yeah, not yeah. the fact that it's going to bankrupt the council. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, let those woke fucks burn. That's but what I say. On the premise of equal pay for equal work, mm. I would say that women are only doing seventy five percent of the labour at work because they're not going for pints with the boys after work, are they? Which is twenty five percent of the the working day. That's not true. So no, come on. You're, you're always in the pub. <laughs> What are you doing tonight? Not on work time. You, but you just said that, that it's work. Yeah. You said women aren't out. Well, I was actually being facetious because I was I've mocking you. your point. You've just well, been, no, no, no. I was mocking... Been, you've just been had. I've just been Ollie Dugmore. You've just been Ollie Dugmore, yeah. <laughs> I was mocking you. You can't mock me when I'm mocking I'm unmockable. You. I nearly died in a pothole the other day. <laughs> well, so why are you so pissed off about this then? <laughs> because... <laughs> What do you mean? You should, I am you should be glad he's filling this. in the potholes. But he's not filling in the potholes, is he? I think he is. He's given the money to fill in the potholes, to be fair. But the councils aren't actioning it. Why not? I guess it takes a bit of time, doesn't it? 
It takes about half an hour, doesn't the, it? The, no, no, because the problem you is... You mix it up and pour it in the hole. Yeah, but what the problem is, yeah, if you actually procure a contract or you put a contract out to tender legally and you don't just give it to one of your friends, it actually does take a, a bit of time. Shit, we should give the money to Michelle Moan. There was a time... Yeah. ...when we administrated a quarter of the world's landmass. We had an empire... Yeah, but I think there were potholes in... Uh... Yeah, but we fucking filled them in. No, we didn't. We did. Famously, we did. Famously? Fa sorry, Famously. Hang on. Famously, Famously, we filled in the potholes. When we... And if the potholes couldn't be filled in, do you know what we did? We, be, we built rail I was railroads. so frightened about what you were going to say. <laughs> <laughs> we committed a massacre. Do you know what? I, I was so frightened. <laughs> There's, there's a binary in the British Empire. It's, we will fill in your potholes. Yeah. We may also kill like a thousand people in Amritsar. I don't actually think that that binary, I think the first point of that, actually, we will make you fill in the potholes. Mm. That's the... Yes. Mm. But that wasn't my point. Right. My point was that we were quite effective at filling in potholes during no, the empire. No, no, no. Okay, that's, a, that's an abstraction. <laughs> my point is, my point is you go from being a country that colonizes huge parts of the planet, right? Right. And I'm not saying that's a good thing, to be absolutely clear. It is nonetheless mm -hmm. a substantial feat. You're going to get done by GB News for Oh, this. fucking let them come. <laughs> You've got my number, Patrick Christie's. <laughs> um, now we can't even fill in a pothole. No. It's pathetic. Can we not fill in a pothole or do we not want to fill in the potholes? I think they want to fill in the potholes. Obviously. Mm. What's the point in cancelling the high-speed rail line? What, if not to fill in the potholes? That's what he said it was for. Yeah, okay, yeah, you got me now. Yeah, got me now. <laughs> no, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> it should not be a binary. In the same way, it's not, you can have the high-speed rail line or we'll massacre you. Yeah. I think there's a happy medium. But that was the second option, wasn't it? That was the... I didn't hear about that. For HS2, yeah. Really? Well, it's actually more about HS3. Yeah. Who did they want to massacre? Well, I think they, think they were going to do a high-speed railroad to... Uh, to Ireland. Right, nice. They needed that. Yeah. Do you know, do, have, you, have you looked at all of the stuff about why we don't build a bridge to Ireland? I think it would interest you. Please, regale me. No, don't worry about it. Why don't we build a bridge to Ireland? Yeah. Because it, what? Why are you looking at me so perplexed? Okay, okay. What is is the, Is it more complex than it's several miles of open sea. Well, they... <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Fine. You have this one. Do you think it's more complex than that? Well, yeah, I know it is actually, but I'm not going to tell you why. What is, well, no, no, I'm not no, telling you no, why. No, tell me why. I'm not fucking telling you why. Because okay? you don't have an argument. I do have an argument. You clearly don't. They could build one, but the one spot that they want to build it in is where we used to dump all of our munitions and they keep blowing up. So they That's can't... That's obviously not why. That is one of the main reasons. It, can you back me up, Sean? Yeah, it's where the IRA dumps a lot of their No, it's not the IRA. What does this have to do with the liaison committee? Clive Betts. <laughs> a good raw man. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know that. That's info. Um, anyway. So council, local councils are facing challenges. Mm. Rishi Sunak um, But the Conservatives, they, they doubled, didn't they? they? In response to the funding crisis, they doubled the amount of money they're giving to them. Yeah, can I? Yeah, but let's, let's, let's just pick on a really obvious point here. So the Conservatives always say that we, we've, we've put in more money, we've added more money to the pot. Da, 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 da. It's mm. like, yeah, okay, there's also a lot more people here than there used to be. Oh, here we go. And Interesting. what? 
What do you mean? I didn't expect you to pivot to anti-immigration. For God's sake! <laughs> I'm well, talking... No, no, sorry, finish the sentence, go on. There are a lot more people here, so... There are a lot more people in Britain than there were in 1970. And so you're, the count, local councils, who also have more responsibility mm. than they used to have, are going to need more cash. Because obviously... they. And, well, and, that's one answer. And another answer would be... Deport them. And another answer would be, did you know that I think it's one in seven or one in eight NHS hospitals in this country were built before the NHS were est was established? So they're really old. Schools also very old, a lot of very old buildings mm. and they need repairs and that's expensive and that money how about, has to come from the council. How about we build 40 new hospitals? They already did that, Ollie. Well, they're up, are they? Yeah, so what they actually did, it was really, really clever. They actually, uh, they put out like mobile screening units and that counted as a hospital. No. That was their argument at one point. No. Yeah, it was. Are you serious? Yeah, I, I, I promise, promise you. They, 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 were, they were literally like... This is what I mean. Mm. Quarter of the world's landmass. Yeah. That truck over there... Is in a pothole. Hospital. Yeah. <laughs> We are, we are a joke. We are a joke. Ingenuity. Fuck my country. Lob it in the bin. Because you, know, you know what they were talking about with like wartime spirit? They love the wartime spirit. Yeah. Who doesn't have a bit of wartime spirit? Well, exactly, Ollie. And so what they're thinking now is field hospitals. Nightingale hospitals. No, like, I mean, you know, just open air. Oh. You know, why have it in a building <laughs> when you could just have it on a field? <laughs> Yeah, um, genius, that. Like the good old days. You know, you know, too much rack concrete. So what do we do? No concrete. No concrete. Yeah. Eliminate the problem. Um, <laughs> Blue sky thinking. Exactly. That people. You know, at the Somme. Right. Was there a Nightingale Hospital? I tell you what, Florence herself. Did she have a hospital? No, she had a tent and a dream. <laughs> Do you want to do another clip? I, I think the audience probably still had to hear us try and talk about councils, to be quite honest with you. Ah, yes. Council funding. Well, this is it, right? You have to choose. And I think this is the point Betts was making. They've either got to dramatically increase council taxes mm. or cut services or possibly both, which I think is what's happening in Birmingham. Mm. It's not sustainable. And it ties into the financial fiction of the budget where it's like, you go, oh yeah, don't, don't look at this bit. Don't look at the bit in the next parliament where all of these government departments are going to have to make real terms cuts to their budgets. Just, just pay attention to the national insurance cut that I'm, that I'm offering everyone now. Just pay attention to that bit. And it's the same here. It's like, you just lie. You just ob obfuscate and avoid the question waiting for Keir Starmer to come in after you've shit yourself. Clean up my mess, Keir. Florence would be able to sort that. She'd do a great job of that, to be fair. And she wouldn't even need a building. No. I don't think she'd need a I, I wouldn't need a building to clean up someone who shit themselves, to be fair. No. I think it's superfluous. Yeah? You just need a mop. I don't think I'd need a mop. <laughs> but I'm a conservative. <laughs> 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 that is waste in the public sector. <laughs> the entire funding, the the okay, the 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 premise of council tax it, it is starting to feel quite convoluted. And um, the more I think about it, the weirder I think it is. Like how it just actually just is completely nonsensical mm. that you pay in your council tax because you live somewhere, mm. and it goes to a whole slew of public services. That it don't really, it, it doesn't really match up. Like if I'm, okay, I'm renting my flat right now, yeah? Yeah. I think that I should pay for my bins to be collected. And I think that the mm. roads should be sorted. And I think that, you know, some money should go into the police. All of that sort of stuff like makes sense to me. But then when you bring in the service aspect that comes with councils, like my money is going into schools and is going into adult social care, that just doesn't, that feels like a really weird amalgamation of two completely different things. What? You, I wasn't expecting you to go full, like, 
GB News libertarian commentator I'm in not. this episode. Well, you've you've done anti-immigrant. You've Can done, I finish? You've, oh, sorry, was there? Have I misunderstood? Can I finish? Have I misunderstood something in what you were saying? What I'm saying is the budget for adult social care. Yeah. Housing. Mm. Um, schools, I think that money should come straight out of central government. I don't think that should be devolved funding. Right. Because, right? Why is that GB News? Why is that GB News? Well, that is not GB News. I, I think what I was understanding you, to, what I thought your argument was going to be, if I don't use the service, why should I pay for that it? That was not going to be my argument. Well, I'm glad you clarified it. As now, I was sorry. Actually, so you think we need to centralise more power in Westminster? I think funding like that, yeah, I do think that because particularly with like, okay, the argument about national insurance before when they were first going to raise it, when it was going to be the health and social care levy, mm. and that money was going to go directly into adult social care, mm. that made total sense to me. I could see the logic in that. But that's just like a that was just politics. No, because what's going to happen? Like. That was just how they were selling it to you. Fine. I liked the sell. I bought it. All right? You bought that shirt. Some of us questioned that decision too. This is a white shirt. <laughs> this is a normal shirt. I should have gone for the trousers, shouldn't I? The trousers I are normal no, no, as no, well. I, like, I actually like the trousers today. <sighs> so I couldn't go for the trousers. You're being very testy. <laughs> I think mm. the people who are best placed to make decisions about the provision of local services are the people in the local area. But they don't have enough money in the local area. That's the problem. And because but you're you saying that, the, 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 that they shouldn't have the taxation. You're saying that the central government should get the taxation. I'm saying central government taxes yeah. should then be allocated to the councils. I think that the, count, the actual money that goes straight into the councils should be for local public infrastructure. Yeah. Not housing. Not like... I think that money should come from central government, particularly when you think about like the mess that's going on at the moment with um, asylum seekers, how they're all being bunched down in, in Kent, in mm. Dover, and that is um, bankrupting the council because they're having, they're putting everyone up in hotels there because the home office can't be bothered to process them mm. and it's bankrupting the council mm. and they keep saying we need more money for this and then central government are like well you you get your council tax don't you fucking use that mm. and they're like okay well we can't put up all these people while we wait for you lot to decide whether they can live here or not mm. while um and also provide good schools and good roads yeah do you see what I'm talking about now? Kind of, yes. I think um, for Jesus, house... It's really making me work for it today. Yeah. Well, just a bit of consistent intellectual consistency, I think, is a good thing, for sure. Um, <laughs> I think that there needs to be a rapidly expanding house building programme for which government should provide the central, central funding for, probably actually by grants rather than loan to local authorities. Um, we have covered, actually, and there's a piece on our YouTube channel that Laura and I made about the temporary accommodation crisis and the the way that it's impacting um, council budgets uh, to quite an extraordinary extent. I think we're going to try and get Vicky Spratt on the podcast actually to talk more about that at some point in the future. Um, but I, I also just fundamentally think that um, council housing is one of those fundamental public services that councils should be providing. So Yeah, but what did the councils do? Because they were running out of money, they didn't build more council houses, right? So when everyone did right to buy on them, they didn't have the funds to start. They were actually new. Um, prevented by legislation from from building building oh, new I should, houses I with that money. I should watch that video then that you did, didn't I? <laughs> I? Did you not watch it? I did watch it, but I don't remember. We you covered it. We, we did cover it. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, you really want to get on that train to Cornwall, don't you? Oh yeah. Do you think the most threatening thing for Ed would be for you to tell him that he's going to sleep with the fishes? Yeah, <laughs> that would be menacing for him. Mm. But he already is, so he's going to make his peace with it. What do you think he's like in the sea? He doesn't go in the sea. Does he not? No. Because of the fish? Yeah. He doesn't like going in the sea. <laughs> okay. Another clip? Sure. Roll the clip. Have you now got an airline that will be able to send people to Rwanda, or are you going to use the RAF? Uh, the, the Home Office are making all the appropriate arrangements. There's a range of options that they're considering. I, d I wouldn't expect me to get into the detail of those because they may well involve, as you would expect, uh, commercial 
uh, well, we know conversations. It's costing eleven thousand pounds per but I, what I can individual. Say is the preparations are all being made and have been made for a while to operationalise okay. the bill. So you're not able to say if there's an airline or not. I, so I wouldn't expect me to get okay. into commercial conversations. But all okay. the prepar preparatory work to operationalise okay. the bill has been in place for a while. Okay. So over thirty-three thousand people have arrived in the UK irregularly since the Illegal Migration Act came into force last July. So are you expecting to send all 33,000 people to Rwanda? Because obviously they can't make a claim for asylum in this country. Yes, well as you know the bill has to get royal assent and then subsequent to that yes, the bill has yeah. to be put in force and there will be choices about which cohorts to uh, okay. initially apply the, um, uh, the policy to. There's a range of different options for that. That's all in the planning work but that's being done. So there's 33,000 so, yeah, in limbo. So I just want to be clear, are you expecting that group will go to Rwanda? I said we, we've been, my general view, I probably wouldn't characterise it as being in limbo, is anyone who arrives here illegally should not be able to stay. That well, is the government's and my very clear position and we will do everything that we can to okay. remove them. Do you agree that there is a moral case to support Lord Brown's amendment to the Safety of Rwanda Bill to ensure that Afghans who helped our armed forces in Afghanistan are not sent to Rwanda? Yes or no? Uh, we, we have an existing scheme it's to bring... It's not working though, is it? That's uh, the problem. Well, yes, it's brought thousands of people to the UK and under three different streams. Um, and we, obviously, in the interest of time, we don't need to go over them all here, but there's two different schemes, there's okay. multiple different strands, and we have brought thousands of people safely from Afghanistan okay. to the UK to provide them with uh, so the sanctuary. Highest, the and that contributes to our overall okay. numbers of around half a million people that we've welcomed to the UK through safe and legal okay. routes over so the, the past the highest, few years. the highest group so within the small boats at the moment are from Afghanistan, aren't they, at 20%. So there is an issue about why those schemes are not working. My very final question... Well, I just think on, on that, that doesn't mean the schemes are not working. It might just mean that there are many more people who would like to come to this well, country than we have the resources and the capacity to safely look the after. And I think you can respect, see that. Prime Minister. I you don't can think see that's that. the view of most people looking at those schemes and uh, how slow they've been. This is the closest, I would say, um, tete a tete that we see in the Liaison Committee that has the, the same energy as Boris Johnson's uh, beefs. Sunak and Diana Johnson. I would describe as Sean did on the YouTube channel, I would describe Rishi Sunak as rattled. Rattled. Rattled in that interaction. Mm. And, you know, he has a bit of a habit to oversell things that happen in Parliament yes. on that YouTube Daily channel. Daily Mail, that one over yeah, there, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's fucking love the headline. All caps. Blah. Yeah. It's terrible. Mm. Terrible. But I actually think it was true there. What did you say? Sorry, Ollie, where were you? Thank you, Ava. Mm. Um, yeah, he just, he sort of, he, and actually Sunak was at his most Johnson-like and that he started just sort of like filibustering. He was just trying to talk so that she couldn't ask him more questions. Um, interesting. He was, it was, it was clear, a clear departure from his previous, I am a master of detail. I am a technocrat. I understand these things. He's clearly very self-conscious about his Rwanda policy. I would be too. Why? Because it's totally embarrassing. None of it makes any sense. Mm. You know, this is a guy who apparently is really good with numbers. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. You know, he was talking actually at the, early on in the uh, liaison, he was talking about how um, a significant portion of adults do not understand basic arithmetic. Now, Rishi, <laughs> I've had a brief look at this. <laughs> Are you one of them? <laughs> um, you know that he's totally protected by commercial interests with this. So that's what he should have done. There's a really, uh, I think it's a totally bizarre loophole that should actually be abolished, which is that if you've, if you've got a commercial company that's doing work for the government, you're not allowed to do a freedom of information request on it. So you're not ever allowed to ask what... I don't know, what time will this person be on a flight back, uh, to, not back, excuse me. What, what, person will this, what time will this person be on a flight to Jamaica, mm -hmm. deported to Jamaica? You can't ask that because they'll go, sorry, it's a commercial flight and there's a commercial interest. And you go, okay, well, how much is it costing for you to put them on this flight? Can't ask that. Mm -hmm. 
It's, it's really bad obsegation, that. Yeah. Unless it's uh, an RAF flight, in which case yeah. you can. Which they've had to do in some instances, some deportation flights. They have to run them out of RAF, Bryars Norton. Um, because... Where did I go? Well, you sent me there. Where, where was it? Was it in Wiltshire? When that plane was going to take off. You know what I'm talking about. <sighs> Vaguely. I can't remember. I that, cannot. That was several years ago. I can't. It was not several years ago. Uh, it was. It was not. Yeah, it was. It wasn't. Well, when was it? Last year. Nah. Uh, <laughs> what the fuck? Um, nah. That was actually crazy, though, because they were I putting a... Huh? I don't have my phone. I can't look it up. Doesn't matter. Anyway, they were putting a few people on this private flight. And it was like this huge plane. But I, I just kept thinking about the costs that were mounting up to mm. do what was essentially a publicity stunt. Like, even down to like, do you know the people who come along have to scare the birds away from the the runway? Mm. Then they fired up the plane. The cost of of chartering a plane like that, mm. opening up an entire small airport... And for what? So do you just oppose the Rwanda policy on the grounds that it's not cost effective? I, I, but no, I oppose it on both sides of it. I think, I think on the humanitarian argument or the morality argument, I think it's obscene. Mm. And, but, you know, if you're talking to a moron, then you bring up the fiscal argument, which is... Which is what you've just done to me. Li listen, <laughs> I, you've, it's not my fault that I had to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Joanna Cherry as well I think she's, she she got him on this didn't she because she said uh, she said if Rwanda is safe how is it a deterrent mm. what do you like what, how is it off-putting for people if, if it's so safe he didn't really have an answer to that one um, uh, uh, uh. yeah just kind of got him with that he went a bit Mabel actually I think oh. rather than um, rather than Johnson hmm Interesting. Do you know when May used to get a bit... Yes. Yeah, it was quite like that. God, wasn't it just... It made me sick when everyone was pouring out how fantastic she was as a constituency MP. Mm. Theresa May is standing down. No matter what you thought of her. No matter what you thought of her. <laughs> Even with the go-home vans. <laughs> Even with the wind rush. <laughs> Is this someone you know that you're doing an impression of? You. <laughs> I'm doing an impression of you. Fucking cheek of it. Yeah. Fucking cheek of it. Should we know the clip? Sure. Roll the clip. Some of the most popular uh, e-petitions on the government website at the moment uh, regard the situation in Israel and Gaza. And following the UN Security Council's resolution to call for an immediate ceasefire, uh, what steps will the UK government be doing to ensure that that is implemented in terms of using economic and diplomatic levers? Yes, well, we were pleased to support the resolution at the UN because it uh, was consistent with our position, which is for a, an immediate sustained humanitarian pause, which would allow for the safe release of hostages, more aid into Gaza, and provide, the, um, I guess, a platform for a more lasting, durable ceasefire. Yeah, yeah, we will continue to do everything we can, both um, ask uh, and Israel at all levels, to comply with international humanitarian law, to improve the provision of humanitarian aid into Gaza, but also continue to call on Hamas and work with countries like Egypt and Qatar to unconditionally release the hostages. Um, does, to, Prime Minister, does everything we can include looking at the situation of UK arms export licenses? Uh, we have a very robust regime in place for export licenses. There's a, a strategic export licensing criteria. We don't grant export licenses where there's a clear risk um, that the items may be used to commit a serious violation of IHL and that has been long-standing case. And is that constantly under review? Uh, yes, uh, I've made that point clear from the dispatch box previously. So when we look at the situation in Gaza with more than 30,000 individuals um, being killed, 74,000 wounded, and when we look at children specifically, 13,000 uh, children have been killed and 17,000 have been orphaned, um, is that something that is taken into account when looking at the UK arms uh, licences? Yes, I mean you wouldn't expect me to comment in detail on, on legal assessments, but 
you can expect that all the things that you talked about will be things that we, regardless of the export license criteria, are things that are concerning. So that's Kat Smith asking Rishi Sunak about um, selling arms to Israel. Mm. Which I think is, um, I, I feel like we spoke about this relatively recently on the pod, to be honest with you. Uh, the way in which we support um, quite often very, very horrific things uh, at an international level, be that the uh, atrocious bombing campaign conducted in Yemen, which led to, by all accounts, by most, ag- most aid agencies, the worst humanitarian crisis of the century so far. Uh, whether it be the killing of women and children in Gaza, uh, they use they use British arms mm. to do it, and I don't think there is enough, let's say enough, um, political discussion about that fact. I'm glad she's brought it up. Um, again, he's got out of this on the on a technicality because it's a commercial interest, isn't it? Mm. Well, and he also said um, that the exact phrase being, we don't grant export licenses where there's a clear risk the items may be used to create a serious violation of international humanitarian law. Mm. It's a good line, that. <laughs> I sometimes love lying too. <laughs> <laughs> he loves to lie. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, it would appear to be quite clear that there are breaches of international humanitarian law happening in Gaza right now. <coughs> yeah, but... The, you the, know. Ha- the Hague have ruled that there's a plausible case that a genocide is being committed. Yeah, but, you know, did any of our weapons try to turn off water? <laughs> That's what you've got to think about. And it's probably what Rishi's thinking about too. Oh. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about this. Because the, the counter... Well, no, sorry. I do know how, exactly how I feel about us selling them arms. But the counter argument, which I don't know how I feel about, which is like, well, if you don't sell them, they'll just buy them from somewhere else. Yeah. But it's like, no, yeah, but, but then we wouldn't be complicit. But also the, at these arm expos, they always make the point that our, our bombs are the best in the world. So, okay, maybe don't give them the best, you know? Maybe they don't need that. What bombs would you give them? Like F-class? How know. far down? I could make a really... I'm, I'm, I'm not making the joke. We should give Israel our love bombs to drop on Gaza. See, mine was so much better. But yeah, well, you, you turned down the opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Anything else you'd like to say? Um, there's actually... There's, there's a group that goes around and uh, pickets them. They shut the... the, um, Palestine Action. Palestine Action. Well, it's not just them. There's a few groups. It's actually, I think it's, um, it's like, it's a trade, it's a collective of trade unions. Oh, yeah. And they go and they blockade the entrance so that people can't go to work that day. But um, it's it's so crazy because that one that we went to in Kent, Sandwich in Kent, you can go and watch the video if you'd like to watch it. Hmm. But it's, it's right outside this really beautiful picturesque village. And the people in the village do not know that it's there. They've no, it, it's in the middle of an industrial state, like just outside of it. Mm. And you would not know. It's got no signs on the... Funny that. Yeah. Oh, why don't you want to advertise that? <laughs> why is that? Oh, a safety risk, is it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that idea that we can't tell people about what's here because of safety risk. And the implication in that is because the thing we do is so horrific that it would upset people so much that it would jeopardize the safety of the staff. Mm. Have we considered that maybe don't do the thing you're doing that would upset people so much they would jeopardise the safety of the staff. That is, that could also be a consideration, couldn't it? Yeah. But that's something to think about. Yeah. There was actually a point that day that there was like a, um, a moral maze about the Amazon guy. Right. Whether to let the Amazon guy in or not. Because Amazon drivers themselves are a conflict for a trade unionist because you don't like, you don't like them as a company because they're exploitative. Mm. Right. But the worker is being exploited. Yep. And so you're like, th- there was this sort of dance like, oh, shit, if we don't let him in, then he's going to get in loads of trouble, could get sacked. Mm. Uh, but if we do let him in, then we've let this American conglomerate, you know, I would get have money. paid money to be a fly on the wall for that conversation. So it was very, yeah. And and how did the committee resolve that? I think Was there a vote? No, I think the Amazon guy got bored and left. Fuck you guys, you're boring. Yeah. I've got somewhere else to be. Poor bloke. Um, final clip yeah 
Roll the clip. Also comments on your predecessor when she uh, says she was undermined by, quotes, the, the deep state. Yeah, I think that's probably a question for her rather than me. But I'm just keen to, keen to hear your view, Prime Minister. Is, Sorry? is, there, is there a deep state? Or are you part of it? Am I part of it? <laughs> Yeah, probably a question for her. <laughs> not, I, pro not I probably wouldn't tell you if I was, Will, would I? No, no, no. no and, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't and, I, <laughs> and we we wouldn't tell anyone else no, either. I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell anybody else either, Sir Bernard, if I was. So it's not just a case of perhaps a, a few chaps getting you know overly excited after a good lunch, say at the Garrick, is it? <laughs> question for her. You mentioned it at the top of the episode. A little bit of pally back and forth about Rishi Sunak being a member of the deep state. Yeah. There was a little Garrick joke in there as well, wasn't there? Was there? Yeah. Well, it's not like going to a members club and having a few drinks then, is it? No, no, no. And then Rishi was like, <laughs> I wouldn't tell you if it was. I tell you what, I saw a clip, very recent clip of Simon Case. I saw the clip recently. I don't know how recent the clip was. I don't know where it's from. In front of the liaison committee. And he makes a joke about the Garrick club. Mm. And he says something like, you know, I'm a reformist. There's a there's a question of maths, you know, if I leave, then that's one less person who believes the club should change. You know, I believe we should try and we should participate and reform from within. I think that's a terrible argument. And then some of the members of the liaison committee chuckle and laugh. Yeah. And go, actually, I have a, I have an interest to declare here, Chair. My membership of the Garrick Club, I think it was Gen, it was Jemrick or Buck, it was Buckland. And they're all kind of laughing and joking. And then there's an SNP, um, Angus McNeil, and I think... Harriet, it now. Harriet, Bol Harriet Baldwin. And they're sort of going like, what are you guys talking about? And essentially it's like an in-joke about being a part of it so you can reform it from within. Yeah. Was, I've not seen something recently where someone looked as smug as he did. Well, it's a good joke, to be honest. The, you know, You're right, it is. Yeah, it's hilarious. For people who like, like you know, Mrs. Brown's boys. But for like, it's like, the, it's like the top, the top civil service equivalent. Mm. <laughs> we haven't spoken about the Garrett Club. Do you know I'm totally unbothered by the Garrett Club? I think if I really? was, if I was going to be bothered about a private members club, it would be the Beef State Club. That one would annoy me. Are you going to talk about that one? What am I not allowed to talk about? That could, one? No. Well, obviously, I'd have to declare an interest. But yeah, no. Um, talk about it. Go I on. think Oscar Wilde got. I think Oscar Wilde's still on the book in the toilet. Right. Anyway, that's its one redeeming quality. But you, you um, need to tell people about what you're talking about because people won't know what the Beef State Club is. Well, it's like the Deep State, isn't it? I can't, I can't disclose. No, it's um, the Beef State Club is basically a, a members club that is one big round table, and you all sit on one table, and it's where essentially any decision that might impact the rest of the country is made. So. The next leader of the Conservative Party is decided at that table. It is. Why do you keep raising your eyebrows at me? Because people will say that the next leader of the Conservative Party is decided by its leadership election, which is multiple rounds of voting by the MPs, followed by a vote by the membership. So how does the Beef State Club orchestrate who the next leader of the Conservative Party will be? Okay, so for example, a couple of chaps will go down there actually quite a few chaps, and they'll decide that they would like to trigger a leadership election. Mm. That is where the last le leadership election, that is where it was decided that mm. everyone would start handing in their letters in on Boris Johnson was in that club. That is the club that everyone should be worried about. Any chapettes? Chapettes. Yeah. You can go. Women. Yeah. You can go. Are yeah. you allowed to vote in the... Is there voting? No, 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 no. It's not a voting thing. Right. It's just, it's a very... Um, what do they do? They eat dinner. Are the women allowed to eat dinner? At the table, yeah. But presumably on the Sorry, day that they when you, say, when you say at the table, you immediately evoked in me the idea that there was like a kid's table that like <laughs> the women had to sit on. Well, that's good that you didn't think they were like under the table. Please. Yeah. Have some decorum. What? I would never say something like that. Well, I, okay. I, <laughs> let's, let's pretend that for the cameras. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Ollie would never say anything like that. My jokes about people giving head to other people mm -hmm. extend exclusively. Are never jokes. <laughs> no, first of all, they're never jokes. Second of all, they're exclusively about my male colleagues. Okay. Like Ed Campbell. Yeah. Two episodes ago. <laughs> yes. Um, anyway, that's a club that I think everyone should get riled up about. Not mm. about the Garrett Club. Because also, 
it's so wanky. Like if you actually look at like the list of people who are a member there, it's so um, across the spectrum. Whereas beefsteak is much more conservative. Right. It's so. The, if the, they if they let women in to the Garrett Club, to the Garrett Club, and uh, they offered you a membership. Yeah, of course I would take it. Mm. I'm not some conscientious objector to the Garrett Club. <laughs> like, no, I send back a white feather. Like, yeah. fuck off. No, no, you'd be walking down the street and then like a senior Tory, like Sir Graham Brady would like hand you a white feather and be like, coward. Yeah. But you know, look, it doesn't, it, to me, it's exactly the same as going to um, Strangers Bar on the terrace, mm. like the Garrett Club, because it's full of the same media elite quote unquote and it's full of MPs and it's very selective in that staffers can't get in there you know and it's also very difficult to get into the lobby that's also a pretty quite a membership club isn't it if I could let you in though what kind of stupid <laughs> why did they do that how long do you think it'll last for I've actually I don't know we've got to re probably reapply for that uh, 25 soon. I think is the mm. yeah. alright can't wait for that round of uh, mm. <laughs> negotiations <laughs> Uh, uh, why do you need this pass saver? Well, I can't get into the Garrick, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm settling for Strangers Bar. Yeah, no, but it's it's the same. It's the same. Um, and you're just getting all high and mighty about how, like, Joanna Lumley was the person who I think was nominated by Hugh Bonneville to like get into the Garrick Club to try and make some sort of parity amongst the sexes, and it was like Joanna Lumley. I love, I lo I love like her in Absolutely Fabulous, but like. In terms of like pioneering women's rights. She cares more about the Gurkhas than women. Bloody Lumley. No, but seriously, Joanna Lumley being allowed into the Garrett Club. She what, should be in the Gurkha the rape Club. rape conviction rate is suddenly going to go up. Like, come on. No, I mean, like, it's going to get better for women, is right. it? I'm not, right. not, you know, that's what I'm saying. Got you. Like, it's not going to suddenly make misogyny go away because Joanna Lumley can go and drink in there. Well, we don't know if we don't try. <laughs> right. It's worth giving it a go. Yeah. You're not convinced. The only funny part of the Garrick story has been that when Amelia Gentleman wrote the story, she negated to mention that... Uh, negate, failed to mention that her father-in-law was a member of the Garrick Club. I just thought that was quite funny. Everybody knows now. Mm. Got any pearls of wisdom? What do you think about the Garrett Club? Oh, I couldn't give a shit. I think if I had said I cared, I think you would have wanged on about, you would have got your eye, this is what feminist looks like t-shirt out. I just, it's a private club. Like, if they want to not allow women in, and we, they can do that, and we can all go. You're a bunch of horrible pricks. But at the end of the day, it's still a private organisation. It's not like, I don't know, fucking like, the FA, or Parliament. Do you know? What I mean? It's just like a private thing. If you're a private members club, you get to decide who the women are, who the men are <laughs> that you let in. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to start a private members club and then start deciding who and who isn't a woman. They should so that when Rishi Sunak says to Keir Starmer at PMQs, what is a woman? He doesn't know. He can say, I defer to my right honourable friend, Mr. Dugmore, the member for... Where would I be the member for? Islington North. Would you? You wouldn't, you wouldn't go Stratford-upon-Avon? No. No. We can't, gonna, we can't win there. You know what I'm going to shock everyone with? It's, the fact that we're talking even about the women thing and not about the class thing about that club. It's yes. just like, it's yeah. mental. Mm. Listen, I'm not allowed in there, mm. but she should. Yeah. Like. Yeah. It's so stupid. So I think we've probably polished off most of the liaison committee there. Yeah. What time are you at the Garrick later? So this is probably the, the part where you and I now engage in another staring contest or something oh, I'm not in the mood for that to be honest what are you in the mood for I mean I'm my, dancing I'm emotional my, I'm emotional today oh yeah you okay oh I'm fine mm. you know I'm just emotional 
I wouldn't pass comment or anything like that. To be well, I know, you know, you never ask. I do ask. <laughs> you don't ask me. How are you? Good. Is this your last day here for a while? No. Oh. So you're off tomorrow? No, you're off tomorrow. Am I? To Cornwall. Ah. <laughs> Robert Halfin's just resigned. Why? As in, standing won't be standing at the next election. Two ministers have resigned. Oh, insurrection! Hang on. Wow, Robert Halfin, Tory MP for Harlow is resigning as the Minister for Apprenticeships and Skills today. He will also step down as an MP at the next general election. MP follows hot on the heels of the departure of Armed Forces Minister James Heapy, who quit his role minutes before. That's quite a... Um, I'd say that's quite a conscientiously timed resignation. Why do you think that? Because Parliament's now in recess for two weeks. Yeah. And so won't get brought up immediately. He can replace him. There's no like public media platform beyond the actual media itself, but there's no public parliamentary platform for them to get dragged over the coals for it. Everyone goes on holiday. I think that's a that strikes me as a conscientious resignation. Yeah. He was quite he was quite a good um he did some good shit on education in Select Committee. Robert Halfen. I'm trying to remember it now. Well he he's been um He's been pioneering the apprenticeships, mm. hasn't he? As well. I'd say well, it's a good job this isn't live because right now we've got we're really fucking at odds to try and figure out something to fucking say about him, eh? Oh, I'm not. Oh, go on. Are you? Well, what do you want to say about him? What, Robert Halfin? No, I, I just think, well, this is what we expected, isn't it? Because the Conservatives have been told by H CCHQ that they had to spread out their resignations. I think far more likely than it being. Um, Parliament, parliamentary recess, I think it's probably because they know that it will be shrouded by the liaison committee. Mm. All of the headlines tomorrow will be that. Or, actually, CCHQ have probably ployed there, or number 10 have planned there, <coughs> that the two ministers would definitely go after the liaison committee in case Rishi really fucked up. Mm. So that that would be the headline the next day instead. There'll also be some big... Big document dumps, weren't there, in the next hour or two? There'll be a big dump of what, sorry? Documents. Documents. Oh, yeah, yeah. there will be, yeah. It's very clever how they do that. <laughs> well, they do. I mean, just when it's a very, very busy news day, suddenly yeah. there's a, a huge publication. All mm. of the information's got to come out at once. I think the last day that that happened was a by-election. Um, I can't remember which by-election it was. But... Um, and they, in that, they released how much Rishi Sunak was spending on private jets to get him around the country. I hmm. thought that was quite clever. Very. Why, why print it when you can bury it? Nice. You know? Nice. Yeah. Bury being what you did to Ed Campbell. Yeah, and I'm, I'm all finished with printing today as well, so. But that's really, that's, it's a bit bizarre that Halfen would, would quit as a minister... And then stay on the back benches until the election. Do you think that's a sort of plea bargain that he's made? No, nah, it's just... No, because that's totally them, bizarre. It's just saving the headache of a bar election, isn't it? No, what I mean more is, but why would you not stay as minister? Because you get an extra salary to be a minister. <clears throat> There's a lot of speculation that MPs are holding on I guess for a if later you're election going because to, of, they want the extra salary. If you're going to... Yeah, I don't buy that. I think if you're going to... If you... If you resign and say you're not going to stand at the next general election, you've kind of made it clear that your heart's not in it and therefore, like, being in government should not be a... You shouldn't be treading water. That mm. should be, you know... Bruce wants to fucking chill out, put his feet up. There's a nice line in here about Sunak, which probably adds into the delusion that the Conservatives are feeling about the next election. I believe that across the country there is quiet admiration for your work ethic, integrity and ability to solve complex problems faced by our country. But that's actually quite rude. There's quiet admiration. If someone said to me, and I was in like the slew of like a, an onslaught of people being really nasty to me, if someone said, I think there's actually some quiet people out there who quite like you, 
quiet about people. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Was that in his resignation letter? Yes, it was. Yeah, that was what Halfing said. I guess maybe it's a way of saying <laughs> there are people who admire you. Just when the polling organisations come round and ask how they feel about you, they're just they're just not piping up. Just like, don't worry, don't worry about it, mate. <laughs> they're not telling the truth. <laughs> it's because it's so socially embarrassing to be seen to say that they like you. Yeah. <laughs> they're keeping quiet. But there's always the postal votes, Rishi. You know, mm, <laughs> there's yeah, always yeah, the postal, the postal votes. Vote, yeah. Would you like to say anything about Robert Halfin? <sighs> What's that now? More than sixty-five. Significant number, isn't it? Yeah. Rats and a sinking ship. That's what I'd like to say about that. Labour are really struggling with their selection process, though, as well. Because <laughs> they won't fucking let anyone left wing stand I know. <laughs> they are really struggling. <laughs> it's quite difficult. I've, I've, I understand as, a, as a, an allegedly left wing political party to field candidates if you won't select anyone that's yeah. actually left wing. Should we finish there? Yeah, we could just say that quickly about Labour. Please. They Because they don't... Part and part because they don't know when the election is. <clears throat> they're not rushing to do... They haven't been rushing to do the selection process and now they're rushing to do it. And they're not perhaps vetting candidates as well as they should be. Mm. So I think a lot of lo a lot of councillors will basically just get pushed in. Um, That's what happened. That's why you end up with fucking wrong ones like Scott Benton and such for exactly. the Tories. Because they didn't properly, you know, if you're... Uh, if you're the Conservative Party, you're not like thinking, we really need to vet our Blackpool guy because you think he's not going to fucking win. Like you just put up anybody, so you, you say you fielded a candidate and then the red wall happens and all of a sudden you go, fuck, Scott Benton's in Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> so yeah, that selection process is, is important. Good. You in there? I think so. Should we end there? Yeah. Some good memes in the subreddit the last couple of days. Really good memes. Great news about the memes. You're all really weird. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I do too. Yeah. I think it's cute. It's quite nice on there because also like no one... It's very select. Mm. Who's contributing to that? It's nice when they're not screaming about something. Yeah, but you know, you got to take the good with the bad, really, don't yeah. you? You know, otherwise you get a big I, head. Uh, yeah, and I do think the favour is more, it, it splits more in favour of the memes than it does people losing their minds about a video. Someone called us transphobic on yesterday's podcast. Good. Yeah. But I think, I think it's good. It's nice to know that people are listening to the podcast literally. <laughs> 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 just, I'm just imagining, like, <laughs> if the things we said were interpreted literally, what it would say about our worldviews. Yeah. It would be traumatic. It would be concerning. Yeah. I think irony is the only thing that's meant we haven't been referred to the Prevent program yet. <laughs> Does Prevent take in account irony? <laughs> Well, I'm assuming that's the only reason why they haven't come round yet. Has anyone ever been an ironic terrorist? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, cool. That's us. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>